So it looks like it's that time of year. Thanksgiving. It's almost Thanksgiving. A little holiday we have here in the USA where we get together, express our gratitude for all the good things in our lives, and eat a metric ton more food than usual. The table hosts the usual suspects, with your turkeys, your squashes, your green beans, potatoes, and cranberries. But until recently, there was a major player on this holiday table spread. A player who wasn't just a supporting role, but at times, the star. One that many of the eaters, especially the kids, not just looked forward to, but craved. A player that only recently has disappeared from the Thanksgiving table, and most tables in general, never to return. Jello. Nowadays, Jello is less of a food and more of a punchline, if not the joke, thanks to its absurd, wobbly texture and colors brighter than a TikToker's hair. Heck, even their pudding isn't safe, being the subject of one of the 90s most enduring memes. Stu, what are you doing? Making chocolate pudding. But believe it or not, Jell-O wasn't just acceptable. There was a time when it was actually respectable. It wasn't just a staple of American cuisine. It was the whole backbone. But how did Jell-O go from haute cuisine to curiosity? I've got a few theories. Hi everybody, I'm Soul Search and Destroy. And this is the rise and wobbly fall of America's weirdest dessert. In 1894, Charles Knox introduced the first commercially available pre-granulated gelatin sheets. The substance was already a bit of a curiosity even then, given that gelatin was pretty much the byproduct of boiling bones until liquid turns to jelly, thanks to the protein and collagen within the bone marrow. Delicious. Although pretty nasty in both theory and process, Gelatin became a favorite source of protein in many cultures, and with the onset of the Industrial Revolution, became easier to create without any of the unfortunate smells or flavors. But Knox recontextualized the culinary curiosity as a dessert and convenience food for American housewives. And a few years later, a cough syrup manufacturer, Pearl B. Waite, and his wife May, took the gelatin powder and added their own fruit flavors along with a whole ton of sugar. Although Mr. and Mrs. Waite weren't able to market their product, they sold their formula and their newly named trademark to their neighbor, Orator Francis Woodward, who, through a few clever strategies and a whole lot of trial and error, soon won over crowds with his new novelty treat. And thus, Jell-O was born, bearing the tagline, delicate, delightful, and dainty. As silly as it sounds, Jell-O ruled the 20th century, especially the first half, thanks to Norman Rockwell's illustrations, a memorable icon, a few nice jingles and some catchy taglines, Jell-O became a household name, rising to stardom in the roaring 1920s and sustaining the nostalgic and impoverished masses of the 1930s. Jell-O was so ubiquitous that it was even used on the set of The Wizard of Oz, with the horse of a different color being six horses wearing a respectable wardrobe of differently flavored and colored Jell-O. During this time, Jell-O introduced its instant pudding mix, and soon a whole ton of recipes centered entirely around Jell-O, both the gelatin and the pudding, exploded in the 1940s, including Southern Coca-Cola salad, consisting of cherry Jell-O with Coca-Cola, maraschino or fresh cherries, crushed fruits, and topped with a dollop of cream. Weird, sure, but not unreasonable, all things considered. The flavors do make sense, which is more than what can be said for the recipes that would soon follow after the end of World War II, because very soon, Jell-O would not be sequestered to just the dessert aisle. This is where it gets grim, folks. I hope you aren't eating while you watch this. Consider this your little content warning, because things are about to get nasty. In the immediate post-World War II economic boom, Americans flooded their homes with new technology, new equipment, new clothes, and new foods. Well, I use the term food rather loosely. 
But to these adults, these new canned goods were exotic, convenient, exciting, and delicious. Jello was among these new ingredients, now used liberally as a leading ingredient in recipes, essentially hacks for busy housewives hosting dinner parties. The savory Jello salad was a mainstay of the 1950s and 60s dinner party. It was a starring player in barbecues, potlucks, and favored by housewives, church ladies, cafeterias, and even certain fine dining restaurants. Ingredients found in these Jello salads included canned tuna, shrimp, boiled eggs, chicken, pimento stuffed olives, celery, onion, radish, mayonnaise, pretty much all the things that nightmares are made of. Such popular recipes included jellied beef mold, chicken jello salad, tomato aspic, and my personal favorite, lime and cheese salad. Oh my goodness! Squidward! Jello actually complemented this trend by releasing savory flavors meant to suit these ingredients, such as celery-flavored Jello, which, incidentally enough, was discontinued the same year, though pff, I can't imagine why. One of the most famous Jello salad recipes, dating from 1904 and reached peak popularity in the 1950s, was the Perfection Salad, consisting of Jello set with vinegar, olives, celery, green pepper, and shredded cabbage garnished with lemon juice, mayonnaise, and lettuce leaves. The recipe was such a hit that it was actually awarded third place in a recipe competition, and variations of it were featured on every dinner party from 1904 to 1964. And apparently it was best served with a side of oysters. Thankfully, there were less offensive jello salads that centered mercifully around sweet ingredients, such as fruit, cream, yogurt, and candy. Needless to say, these dessert recipes outlasted their savory counterparts. So why were mid-century Americans so obsessed with Jell-O? Why were they using it in recipes it really didn't need to be in, and pairing it with ingredients that had no place sharing a table with it? My best guess was the convenience of it. The immediate post-war period was a time of radical change in the home, with the explosion of new tech to make domesticity as easy as possible for the women, resuming their roles as housewives after working long and grueling hours during the war in factories. Along with dishwashers, washing machines, and electric mixers, Jell-O was one of those new conveniences. I can't totally blame the GI generation for latching onto Jell-O the way they did. You have to remember, these people grew up through really difficult times, and Jell-O was something of a comfort food. And not only was it a comfort food, it was a major savior. The high protein content meant that you would fill up on this pretty easily. And it was also a key factor in preserving leftovers. During the Great Depression and the rationing of the 1940s, we absolutely could not afford to waste food, especially not vegetables, which had no shelf life at all. Jello was one of the ways people extended the life of their vegetables and their foodstuffs. And it was a quick and affordable meal during the hardest of times. So these adults of the 1950s and 60s who served in World War II, who grew up during the turbulent 20s and the impoverished 30s, and through wartime rationing, among other terrible things, I can understand why they turned to this. Still not an excuse. So I can't really judge the GI generation for their prolonged obsession with Jello. Oh, okay, maybe not. More than anything, these Jello salads were mostly fad foods, meant to catch the eyes and attentions of guests. I'd compare it to those flashy colored foods on Instagram or those ridiculous hack recipes on TikTok. I mean, they look cool on the screen and in pictures and in little videos, but in reality, they were not for eating. And I have a feeling that is exactly what these savory jello salads were to these people. These molds were, in all likelihood, probably not delicious. But they made a statement at a party. And the intentions behind them were good. But good intentions paved the wiggly, wobbly, artificially flavored road to hell. And jello would soon have hell to pay down the line. After so many questionable recipes, it's understandable that the American public would experience a little jello fatigue. Sales began to drop in the 1970s, especially as kids 
who grew up with their GI generation parents' mega nasty recipes, understandably grew sick of the wobbly stuff. Also not helping was the fact that the new wave of working mothers showed a lot less interest in buying the oversaturated product, especially not as a lunch or dinner mainstay. Jello was forced to get creative with their branding. Thankfully, this meant taking Jello off the dinner menu and back onto the dessert tray. Commercials and ads emphasized the fun, sweetness, colors, and silly texture of the product, specifically to appeal to kids. One of the campaigns focused on jigglers, small jello snacks sold in fun and creative shapes, such as stars, hearts, circles, and squares. Into the 80s and 90s, jello came prepackaged in snack cups to be featured in school lunches, and all the way into the 2000s, it was a frequent player in school cafeterias, sleepaway camp mess halls, and the occasional church party or barbecue. I myself have some pretty vivid memories of jello, whether it was making and molding it myself, or eating it at summer camp. As long as it didn't get too crushed up or mixed up with the other foods, it was pretty fun. But Jell-O remained exceedingly popular in certain pockets of the country, all the way into the early 2000s. It was especially favored in the Latter-day Saints communities in the American Southwest, especially Utah, where Jell-O was so popular that there was even a legislation passed to make it the state's official dessert. Salt Lake City became the biggest consumer, to the point where the area of the country was referred to as the Jell-O Belt. It's hard to pin down the exact appeal Jell-O had for its Mormon fans. Perhaps this was due to the traditional mindset of the community, the good memories these people had of the gelatin recipes of their childhoods. Some believe it's due to their association of Jell-O with wholesome, traditional family values. But as with all empires, Jell-O's reign over the 20th century came to an end. The Atkins diet, which originated in the 1970s, rose to popularity with adults during this time. It's an extremely low-carb diet, notorious for its astringent omission of most desserts and sugar. However, there was one dessert that managed to slip its way into this diet. Jell-O. Specifically, sugar-free jello, which had originated in the similarly health-conscious 1980s. To hop on this trend, jello placed emphasis on the sugar-free line, specifically catering to dieting grown-ups. Needless to say, this backfired pretty significantly. Jell-O was already becoming passe and considered outdated by most of the country, especially adults. Dieting is already difficult enough as it is. But bringing back jello as a diet food especially to the adults on the Atkins diet, who had most likely lived through and survived the Jell-O salad heyday, added insult to injury. It was bad enough having to give up carbs and cut calories, but only having an outdated and weird textured nightmare from your childhood to look forward to after a bland meal? Well, yeah, that just about did it. Even worse was its presence in retirement homes, as the de facto dessert on the buffet table thrown haphazardly into huge bowls, crushed to colorful, sugary, jiggling oblivion. Another instance of insult to injury for the aged population, who had most likely made jello monstrosities in their younger days, and probably regretted it after seeing the error of their ways. And talk about ironic. More than anything, I think jello is just the victim of its own success. As with all things, what comes up must come down. And when it comes to desserts, you had so many more options. Not to mention dinners. The 2000s saw an explosion of prepackaged foods. And even now, it just does not seem viable to, well, have jello for dinner. The previous oversaturation, its presence in retirement homes, and its new attempt at being diet food were the nails in the coffin for the brand's respectability. Jello had gone from cuisine to joke. This is the way the world ends. Not with a bang, but with a wobble. But now we live in a retro-obsessed world. Between perms and cassettes and VHS tapes, Jell-O seems to be making a bit of a comeback. Mainly in certain pockets of the United States, such as the American South and the aforementioned Jell-O Belt, and some parts of the Midwest. But it's mostly the South that is keeping this trend alive. And not just alive, they are really revitalizing it. Some of the recipes, 
in fact, the majority of the recipes are sweet and look kind of respectable, such as this nice recipe for stained glass cake that honestly looks quite nice. But of course, there's always gotta be, you know, one or two bad apples that have to spoil a barrel for everyone else because somebody, in their infinite wisdom, decided that it would be a good idea to resurrect the savory jello salad. And some of these are veering into crimes against humanity territory akin to the 1950s, such as, you know, jello egg salad and tomato aspic made with buttermilk ranch dressing. <laughs> Though it looks as though the savory jello salads are pretty much going to stay in the past, new forms of desserts utilizing jello, or at the very least unflavored gelatin, are on the rise thanks to their photogenic appearances. <laughs> Boy, talk about history repeating itself. While it may not reach its former superstar status anytime soon, I think it's worth revisiting this culinary curiosity once in a while. Who knows? For you folks in the US of A, Maybe it's worth revisiting the old school cranberry jello sauce on the dinner table with your turkey, or perhaps as a fun take on the dessert tray. So, what do you think? Would you make jello anytime soon? Did any of these recipes sound good, or are you happy that this is not a thing anymore? Do you have any memories of jello? Did you grow up with any of these recipes? I'm very sorry. Comment below. Also, if you want me to discuss more nostalgic curiosities and see more analysis about Vaporwave and Synthwave, then don't forget to like and subscribe and hit the bell for the notification. Oh, ew, it's falling apart.